Hi, good afternoon, good morning, or good night, depending on where you're joining us. Thank you for being in our site presentations. Today is going to be a really exciting topic, and I'm really honored to be able to present Dr. Marilena Savoya and the panel. Dr. Marilena Savoya is a consultant neonatologist at Santa Maria de la Misericordia Hospital, Udine, and contract professor in neonatology in the postgraduate spe specialization in pediatrics at Udine University. She developed her interest in neonatologist performed echocardiography with Professor Nick Evans in Sydney 2008 and in neonatal pulmonary hypertension with Dr. Steve Athman in Denver in 2013. She has a master's degree in pediatric cardiology from Bologna University and has been a member of the ESPR governance structure on NPE since 2018. Marilena is the lead of the first edition of the Italian training program in neonatologists perform echocardiography, a nationwide project developed by the study group of neonatal cardiology of Italian Society of Neonatology in close collaboration with the Italian Society of Pediatric Cardiology endorsed by the ESPR. She has been practicing lung ultrasound in day-to-day -day care since 2011, exploring lungs and heart cross-tucking. She's in charge of the cardiac follow-up for BPD in NICU and outpatient clinic. And then we will have a fantastic panel who needs no introduction. Dr. Steve Athman is a professor of pediatrics and director of the Pediatric Heart Lung Center at the University of Colorado, Denver and Children's Hospital, Colorado. Throughout his career, Dr. Athman has maintained strong translational research and clinical interest in neonatal lung injury, lung vascular development, pulmonary hypertension, chronic lung disease in the newborn and related topic. He has received uninterrupted NIH funding for research and training grants through his 35 year academic career and funded the Pediatric Pulmonary Hypertension Network and was one of the co-founders of the BPD Collaborative. He recently completed his tenure as president of the American Pediatric Society. Also, we will be joined by Dr. Simona La Placa, who is the chief of the Division of Neonatology at San Antonio Abate Hospital in Trapani, Italy, and a member of the Board of Neonatologists Perform Echocardiography of the Italian Study Group of Neonatal Cardiology. She completed her master's degree in pediatric cardiology after her training at cardiology department at the University of Bologna, and more recently, her master's in bioethics in 2021. Her clinical teaching and research interest includes medical education, diagnosis and management of babies with congenital heart defects, neonatology, neonatal perform echocardiography, genetics, migrant health, and bioethics. She has had an active role in community-wide initiative to help asylum seekers, refugees, and immigrants and their families, and its initiative remains an active quality improvement in the NICU. And also, no need for introduction for the fantastic Dr. Daniel De Luca, who is the Division Chief of Pediatric Transportation and Neonatal Critical Care at South Paris University Eve Claire Medical Center in France, and the President of the European Society for Pediatric and Neonatal Intensive Care. He has a master's degree in pediatric emergencies and neonatal pulmonology from the Catholic University of the Sacred Heart, and is the editor of the European Journal of Pediatrics. Marilena, please start your presentation. Thank you so much. Thank you. All right. Can you see it? Can you see it? It's working. Right. So I don't know what to move this one. Yeah, that up so that that. Right. So um Good morning, everybody. This talk will be about lung and heart interaction in preterm infants with chronic lung disease from the ultrasound perspective. I would like to thank the Neonatal Hemodynamics Research Center, Amis Jane and Patrick McNamara, for the opportunity to talk about this topic, and Laura Thomas, who works so hard behind the scenes, and our exceptional panelists for agreeing to participate, Professor Steve Abman, Professor Daniele De Luca, and Dr. Simona La Placa. Right. And this talk will be about the chronic pulmonary insufficiency of prematurity, which is a respiratory morbidity that goes from birth throughout hospitalization, stay, and infancy and childhood. Therefore, the BPD is a part, just a part of the chronic pulmonary insufficiency of the prematurity. And it's a syndrome with the different uh, phenotypes that usually combine in a single baby. 
Heart and lung do, so I would like to move this thing. I can't see how to do that. Right, this way. Uh, heart and lungs interact continuously. We know that uh, any change in uh, respiratory management would impact hemodynamics. The neonatologist has the ability to assess bedside the, lung, the lungs with the lung ultrasound and the heart with functional echocardiography. And in Italy, we performed two surveys, one between the neonatal intensive care units, one in lung ultrasound, and the other one on functional echocardiography. What we found was that both, both these techniques are largely um, and extensively adopted in the, in, the, in the Italian intensive care units, not only. Uh, the neonatologists do usually perform lung ultrasound and functional echocardiography. This is a unique situation where the neonatologist can assess bedside, both heart and lungs. We'll talk about the cardiovascular phenotype. We do know that it's not only pulmonary hypertension. We, the, despite the pulmonary hypertension is the most severe form of the pulmonary vascular disease, but the cardiovascular phenotype is also cardiac and extracardiac anomalies, which are left-sided anomalies, such as left heart dysfunction, systolic and diastolic, cardiac and extracardiac shunts, such as ASD and PDA, and intrapulmonary shunts. The left-sided anomalies share a common pathophysiology. They, um, the left ventricle, diastolic and systolic dysfunction, the left ventricle um, hypertrophy, and the venous pulmonary stenosis, they all Cause, can cause pulmonary venous congestion that will cause pulmonary edema and in turn pulmonary hypertension. Cardiac and extracardiac shunts too share a common pathophysiology. ASD, PDA, collateral cause pulmonary overflow that in turn would cause pulmonary edema and eventually pulmonary hypertension. This can happen also for small shunts because the pulmonary bed in BPD is vascular, pulmonary bed is reduced. So the bottleneck for both cardiac and extracardiac shunts and left-sided anomalies is the pulmonary edema. The question is, can lung ultrasound detect the pulmonary edema? Let's see um, just for a moment the normal lung, just for those who are not still accustomed to the lung ultrasound. The normal lung is divided in two parts. The um, real one that goes from the skin to the pleural line and the artifactual uh, one, which goes from the pleural line downwards. The B lines are a specific um, patho pathological artifacts. They are discrete laser-like reverberation that arise from the pleural line. They move synchronously with lung, with lung sliding and they extend down to the bottom of the screen, canceling A lines. B lines imply that there is an decreased air content due to alveoli partially filled or collapse or a thickening of the interstitium due to edema or fibrosis. Multiple diffuse bilateral B lines outline the picture of the lung interstitial syndrome, which implies a lung interstitial involvement, such as pulmonary edema, interstitial inflammation, and interstitial fibrosis. Lung ultrasound proved to be 
a very useful tool to assess several respiratory neonatal disorders, such as RDS, such as atelectasis, pneumonia, pneumothorax, cystic lesions, and so on. So at this point, we do have two bedside techniques, functional echocardiography and lung ultrasound that allow us to assess both lungs and heart. This strategy is still largely unexplored. I mean, using functional echocardiography and lung ultrasound in combination. Right, let's see how we can assess using in combination lung ultrasound and echocardiography in BPD, starting from birth to discharge. During the evolving phase of the BPD, quite often we can diagnose a PDA, a significant PDA. In this paper, we looked at the uh, surgical closure of the PDA, and, and we checked with these two techniques. We um, looked at the, these babies um, before the surgical closure, performing a lung ultrasound and, and functional echocardiography within an hour of the surgical closure, and then six to 12 hours when it can um, appear the post-ligation cardiac syndrome. Before the surgical closure, the cardiac output, left cardiac output was high, as it happens when there is a significant left to right shunt. And lung ultrasound scores were also high. Within an hour, quite often just after 30 minutes, the um, lung ultrasound score decreases. Decreases meaning that the pulmonary edema uh, disappears, or at least it reduces. Of course, the cardiac output reduces because the shunt is closed. And in those babies who didn't develop post-ligation cardiac syndrome, the cardiac output remains stable, as well as the lung ultrasound score remain quite the same. Um, the, we found very useful to follow up this baby during the uh, peri-procedure peri um, man management. In those babies where the post ligation cardiac syndrome, it, uh, we didn't include those babies in the study, Anyway, in those babies where the post-ligation cardiac syndrome developed, the cardiac output remained pretty the same, but the lung ultrasound score went up again, meaning that the lungs became wet again. The post-ligation cardiac syndrome is associated with a left ventricular dysfunction, systolic and diastolic. And this is the reason why probably the lung ultrasound score went up. So we found useful to use the lung ultrasound in managing uh, post-ligation cardiac syndrome too. Um, I'll try to make some examples. Uh, this is one of those babies we included in the study. This is the pulmonary edema before surgery, a lung interstitial syndrome, as you can see. And this is within an hour. As you can see, lungs dried up and the lungs remain dry after six to 12 hours because the, um, we believe, because the post-ligation cardiac syndrome didn't develop. Let's move on. Let's talk about bronchopulmonary dysplasia. BTD, BPD has an homogeneous parenchyma. We know that a combination of interstitial edema, subpleural consolidation, franchitelectasis, interrobar scarring. Lung ultrasound proved to be a good technique to represent this tissue heterogeneity. Another example, this is the evolving BPD, one of our babies. On the right, on the left side, you can see the chest X-ray. The chest X-ray showed a um, AZ lungs. On the left side, on the right side, you can see the lung ultrasound and an interstitial edema. 
uh, it means water in the interstitium. Why that? Is that due to uh, left ventricular diastolic systolic dysfunction? Is that due to left right shunt? Is that due to just excessive water administration? Using both in combination lung ultrasound and functional echocardiography, you could answer some of these questions. Uh, this author tried to prove that lung ultrasound is useful to monitor diuretic treatment. They are treated a group of babies with diuretics during the evolving BPD phase. Those treated with diuretics um, showed that after a week, the lung ultrasound score went down. According to this order, this was consistent with reduced pulmonary edema as proved by um, a reduction of respiratory support. And they concluded that lung ultrasound could be, be a useful tool to guide the diuretic treatment. This is another example, one of our babies that we treated with diuretic treatment. As you can see on the left side, the um, lungs are wet. On the, right, uh, on the right side, just a couple of days after of diuretic treatment, the lungs dried up very well. Um, these authors too intended to use the lung ultrasound to, uh, see, to monitor diuretic treatment. And they proved that the lung ultrasound score went down after diuretic treatment. But the nice thing to me about this study was that they identified responders and non-responders. Those who didn't respond to treatment were the sicker babies, those with moderate and severe BPD, those with more days of mechanical ventilation. What can we say about that? Severe and moderate BPD can present with a combination of different phenotypes. We also uh, said uh, uh, that, but pulmonary edema in that picture of a combination of different phenotypes is only a part of the picture. So lung ultrasound score could not reduce considerably just given diuretics. Probably a detailed lung ultrasound description could help us tease out different BPD phenotypes and monitor the treatment accordingly. In our unit in Udine, we've been performing the cardiorespiratory follow-up since 2013, using in combination functional echocardiography and lung ultrasound in babies less than 30. Uh, two weeks of gestational age at specific time points, 48 hours, seven days, seven days uh, to assess BPD and BPD severity and BPD uh, pulmonary hypertension prediction at 14 days to assess the evolving BPD and at 36 weeks postmenstrual post age for um, BPD assessment. Therefore, after the discharge, we would follow uh, the babies every four months, but healthy babies would probably get just one uh, scan after discharge. Instead, those with oxygen, um, those oxygen dependent with pulmonary hypertension, those with severe BPD would be checked every one to two uh, months according to international guidelines. At this point, we decided to check our data. We started with the uh, cardiac side. We checked the echocardiographic data. What we found was that our data were um, similar to those found in literature. But the most important thing, thing to us was that the measurements made by uh, the neonatologists and those made by, a, uh, by the pediatric cardiologists 
were had a very good agreement. So we concluded that the NPE follow-up was feasible and safe in both intensive care and outpatient clinic. Right, having seen the cardiac data, now we looked at the lung ultrasound data. We used the uh, Daniele De Nuca score to assess the um, lung ultrasound um, aeration. We know we participated to this um, large multicenter study and uh, that described uh, that those with BPD, those babies with BPD during the hospital stay would track higher compared to those without BPD. We follow up our babies, not only during the hospital stay, but also after discharge, after uh, up to one month. During the entire um, course of our uh, observation from birth to one hour, one uh, year of life, those babies with severe and moderate BPD would track always iron compared to babies with mild or no BPD. They overlapped at the end of the year, about eight months of life. We thought that at that point, probably the lung ultrasound, this technique wasn't able to distinguish the differences between moderate, severe, and babies without BPD or mild BPD. We thought that this could be a limitation of this technique. Right, having a look at the cardiac data, lung ultrasound data, we thought that it was time to match them. Uh, this is a paper um, we are working, still working on it, uh, we uh, made the hypothesis that an impaired left ventricular diastolic function could be associated with pulmonary edema assessed by lung ultrasound score in preterm infants less than 32 weeks. The primary outcome was the correlation between isovolumic relaxation time and measure of diastolic dysfunction and lung ultrasound score. We define diastolic dysfunction in a multiparametric way. As, as an IVRT more than 45 milliseconds, plus one of the following, left atrium to arctic root ratio more than 1.3, or E over E prime more than 12, or E over A less than one. We found uh, two groups of population, one with diastolic dysfunction and one without diastolic dysfunction. The group with diastolic dysfunction was sicker because it had more moderate and severe BPD. And not only, it had a worse oxygenation measured by uh, common indexes of oxygenation. We look then at the cardiac data. Systolic blood pressure was higher in the diastolic dysfunction group, even if still within the normal range. And the indexes of diastolic dysfunction were um, worse. E prime was lower, the index was higher, and left atrium to aortic root was high. At this point, we looked at the uh, lung ultrasound score, and we found that those babies with diastolic dysfunction had a worse both anterior and posterior score. We looked then if there was a correlation between lung ultrasound score and, dias and diastolic dysfunction measures. And we found that there was a, score, a correlation between lung ultrasound score and E prime, between lung ultrasound score and IVRT, and the trend towards significativity of the T index. What we could conclude so far, so far we had a look only at the uh, 36 weeks postmenstrual age time point. 
that there is an association between multiparametric assessment of diastolic dysfunction and BPD severity is assessed by bedside, lung ultrasound, and functional echocardiography. However, it still remains to be established to which extent the diastolic dysfunction contribute to lung score. The analysis, however, is still underway. This is an example to explain of what we are talking about. This is a baby we had um, a year ago, I believe. Uh, he was a 27 weeks gestation, born 27 weeks gestation with severe UGR. At 44 weeks postmenstrual age, still on step up with 80% of oxygen. This was his lung ultrasound at that time. As you can see, lungs were wet. And we look uh, simultaneously at the heart. We found a um, left ventricular hypertrophy and signs, as you can see down here, of diastolic dysfunction, some degree of diastolic dysfunction and mild signs of pulmonary hypertension. We thought that that um, left ventricle hypertrophy could cause some degree, as, you, as we've seen, of diastolic dysfunction and in turn cause pulmonary congestion and pulmonary edema. So we gave diuretics. This was the um, lung ultrasound just three days after. The lungs dried up. The baby went down to from 80% of oxygen to 80% to 30% of oxygen. And three weeks after, we looked at the cardiac ultrasound as well. And the um, left ventricle hypertrophy was reduced as well as the diastolic dysfunction. This is a great study authored by Daniele De Luca and Barbara Loy. They looked at the effects of respiratory effects of patient positioning. They put, to make it simple because it's quite a complex work, they put a group of babies on prone position and they looked six hours after if the lung ultrasound score improved. It did improve just by patient positioning and the indexes of oxygenation improved also. But they looked not only at the lung side, they look at the heart side, the cardiovascular side, and they could prove that changing the, ba the babies to the prone position left the babies from the hemodynamic point of view stable, which is what we want it happens. To make an example and see what we are talking about, this is a very sick baby with BPD we had. This is a, um, uh, an extensive atelectasis, posterior atelectasis. This is just the precise type of baby who we would like to put in a prone position. If you are bedside, you can have a quick look at the baby with lung ultrasound and see that the baby um, if, and see if the baby has atelectasis that can explain uh, bad oxygenation. You look at the baby, you see that the baby has atelectasis, and very easily you can put the baby on a prone position and improve the situation. This is important not only to improve the aeration, but also because the uh, extensive atelectase would affect the pulmonary vascular resistance. And if you perform an echocardiography, you would find some degree of pulmonary hypertension. So the, um, the, the point is that when you find a pulmonary signs of pulmonary hypertension on your 
a functional echocardiography do not go straight away to treat the pulmonary hypertension, perhaps giving vasodilators, but look at the lungs. It's easy. It takes just a couple of minutes. Look at if the baby needs to be recruited first, and then you can think about vasodilator. This is another example. This is a very severe BPD. We had still ventilated at 36 weeks post-menstrual age. This is a baby we uh, discussed a lot about him. And at the end, we decided to track him. So we tracked the baby. A couple of uh, weeks after, the baby was demanding more and more oxygen. So. We performed a, a, a lung ultrasound, which made us worry quite a lot because this looks quite like a pneumothorax. We know that pneumothorax usually uh, doesn't um, develop in a BPD, but you can't exclude it. So we perform an X-ray. This is the X-rays, as you can see. And baby was having air trapping and cystic changes. So we concluded the lung ultrasound, if you use it attentively, can tell you not only if a baby has atelectasis, but also you can suspect, it makes you suspect a trapping or cystic changes. So at the end of the day, the great, the great question is, can lung ultrasound phenotype BPD distinguishing between pulmonary edema, atelectasis, air trapping? What about mixed phenotypes? We believe that the answer lies in combining the clinical picture, the lung ultrasound features, and the functional echocardiography. The lung ultrasound too needs to be combined with a clinical picture as we usually do with the functional echocardiography. Less is more used to say Ludwig Mies, who was a pioneer of the modern architecture. In our small babies with BPD is just the other way around. However, with the tools at our disposal, bedside functional echocardiography, bedside lung ultrasound, we do have the opportunity to, of improving treatment. And like it, we shall see the prognosis. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Marilena, for your uh, very interesting um, presentation and your data and uh, very, very good uh, job um, about the other panelists. I don't know if, uh, if uh, someone uh, would like to, to say something about... Uh, your the data of Marilena, and uh, we can uh, look at the uh, answer on the yeah. So maybe start with the answer in the uh, yes for in the question uh, um, chat. So the first one is what parameters will be monitored at uh, seven days to assess BPD uh, pulmonary hypertension prediction? And um, the other one is, uh, does cystic BPD appear similarly to pneumothorax? I would uh, imagine you would see tons of A-line, but still be able to see lung sliding and not find a lung point. Uh, for the second one, uh, uh, Marilena, you could um, you could uh, answer. And right. for the I can one, tell you what we do. I would start with the second question. Okay. Right. Um, what about pneumothorax? If you suspect a pneumothorax, 
you would be uh, you would find very difficult to see slang, uh, lung sliding. This is what we saw. Of course, it was a focalized um, uh, lung sliding missing. Not it wasn't expensive, but this doesn't happen usually. You would move the slide at least what they call Z score short. Um, let's score, uh, let's say B lines. They are not B lines but because they are not long B lines, but small Z lines, they would move. You would understand that. So if you find that the lung sliding is missing, you should suspect new thorax, or as in this case, it would be the second hypothesis. The first one would be cystic lesion. And, the, um, and the, about the first question, right, at seven days, both echocardiography and lung ultrasound can help you to uh, make a prognosis or prediction of pulmonary hypertension. Professor Steve Abelman here in 2015, I believe, they published a huge um, paper. They proved that if you find signs of pulmonary hypertension at seven days of life, it's, it happens more often that you'll find two things, pulmonary hypertension at 36 weeks and a worse BPD at 36 weeks postmenstrual age. Is that right, Professor? <laughs> and uh, from the lung ultrasound point of view, um, many papers between them, one of first of them, uh, Daniele De Luca published, um, it, um, they proved that a higher score measured at seven and 14 days of life is consistent with um, a future BPD. Um, the cutoff changes a lot according to the paper, but to the papers, but probably Daniele can tell you something more about that because he, he did it. I don't know, Daniele, if you want to comment on it. Yeah, well, thank you. First of all, I would like to uh, congratulate with you for this outstanding work. And uh, uh, I, I knew your papers, and I truly believe, from my point of view, that that's the right direction. I mean, integrating the, the heart and lung, because they obviously go along. And so far before the advent of point-of-care ultrasound, as a broader sense, we didn't have the uh, possibility, because you can't do that with just conventional radiology, you know. So having said that, um, I, I, I always think that we are more tough than, than answers <laughs> because you know why, why you think to these things, there are other questions coming up. And, uh, and obviously I don't know the answers, but um, before um, giving a reflection about that, yeah, you're right. The, uh, the lung ultrasound score at seven and 14 days can actually predict BPD. Uh, we have done a meta-analysis that was eventually published in, Blue, in the white journal of all these studies beyond ours, we tend to say that around 14 days of age, a good score could be like five or six, which is pretty low, to be honest, meaning that babies with a relatively not so much wet lung can actually uh, develop BPD, but that's for the general BPD, not for the moderate severe one, which is the one we are more interested in. And uh, so that's one thing. We also have to uh, admit that the uh, uh, predictivity, the diagnostic accuracy of the score in this sense is good, but it's not so much higher than the classical NIH calculator based on the uh, clinical, on the clinical uh, variable. So to me, the advantage of point of care lung ultrasound in this regard is not only the prediction of what is going to happen later, but there's also the fact that you can visualize the lung and titrate the non-invasive respiratory support and decide what you're going to do, you know, increasing the uh, mean away pressure and eventually up in the future using that to select patients for new experimental therapies. And I really want to say that because it's linked to the beautiful picture that you showed 
you know, with the, um, the, the baby under CPAP and 80% of oxygen that eventually improved with the um, uh, diuretics. Sometimes it happens. Sometimes we, to be honest, we just do that, not leaving them in CPAP. I mean, we, we do not accept 80% of oxygen, but rather we tend to accept much, much higher mini wave pressures in NIPPV, in nasal air frequency, in NAVA, whatever. But anyway, uh, with mean airway pressures much higher. So what is the right strategy? I don't know. Is it better to give them steroids or is it better to uh, uh, to give them more higher airway pressure? Maybe uh, then we, we need to think about the, 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 the potential side effect of steroids as well. That's one thing. Uh, the second point that I want to raise is the, uh, it's all about the distinction between, you know, the pulmonary edema and uh, you mentioned atelectasis, right? But even in a broader sense, I'm not convinced that the BPD lung has edema just because of the excessive water, let's say so. For sure, uh, at least the more severe ones, they have a wide lung also because there's a sort of inflammation over there. Yeah. And if there is inflammatory edema, if there is inflammatory fluid, unfortunately, lung ultrasound cannot make any distinction between the origin of that fluid, you know, and the lung ultrasound scores, and this has been demonstrated in babies, but it's a long experience in adults, also correlates with inflammatory markers over there. So we are looking at the lung that is full of fluid, but is that something that we can treat with steroid, with, with um, diuretics, because it's just water? Or is it something that needs steroids? We cannot make any distinction about that with the uh, exactly. with the lung ultrasound alone. Maybe echocardiography can be useful yeah. over there. This is what I yeah, wanted. we need more research. Yeah, probably in combination, lung ultrasound and the functional echocardiography could answer those questions. I think so. Mm -hmm. Yes, can I add to what, what Danny just said? Number one, Marilena, brilliant talk, fantastic. And I can't tell you how exciting it is to hear the integration of these technologies for greater precision care of our babies. You know, because I think we've been uh, shackled by limitations in terms of what's best evidence for the management of our children. We rely on multi-center randomized clinical trials, and yet all of those studies that are available, number one, are, are rare, scant, and they don't account for the differential phenotypes, the different physiologies that you so beautifully highlighted in your presentation here, where there's a changing picture of how to think about the lungs and the heart and the circulation and the edema in ways that will inform us about do diuretics work or not beyond just the binary question that I just mentioned. You know, when do they work and for whom should we give them? How would we know they would work? So the first time we could truly explore with greater precision potential therapeutics, but most importantly, even for the individual baby, the bedside care of integrating these technologies is tremendously exciting. So I think for all of you and all the folks on the, in the audience as well who are listening, I know you're engaged in the, uh, the targeted neonatal echo programs, lung ultrasound, and, and this is just the beginning of how we're really gonna improve outcomes. The second thing is that as the concept of BPD, I, I love that term from a historical basis, because we think about the phenotyping, the history, how much we've learned. And yet we're hearing right now is from the different phenotypes within that and the changing contributions of airways disease, parenchymal disease, heart disease, pulmonary hypertension itself. All of these things are so important to factor into it. But I always like to say you can't step in the same river twice, meaning that things change over time. What might be good for early identification and prevention depends on when you're doing your assessments. And when we say BPD, what exactly do we mean by that? Since we know even those who without that label of BPD can have poor respiratory outcomes or at risk for adulthood disease across the lifespan. So to me that you're launching a new venture here, all the folks involved with this, very exciting. And I think there are a lot of tremendous things to do. So, so kudos to you and great presentation to spark this. And, um, one of the questions I want to ask you, though, Marlena, and, and others perhaps, is like the last case you showed with severe BPD when they have heterogeneous lung disease and they remain ventilator dependent, 
you know, beyond 36 weeks of life, you see such regions of over distension and regions of underinflation. And so part of the question is, isn't how to better deliver mean airway pressure or, you know, many of those questions of what we do, but how to better distribute gas. So we want to optimize FRC to lower pulmonary vascular resistance. We also want to avoid regional over distension with neighboring lung that we just can't open up and recruit. And yet if we increase our settings on the ventilator, we could even make things worse. So for this concept of heterogeneity of lung regions, Marlena, number one, how early do you think we could recognize that region by region to identify perhaps susceptibility for lung disease? But then if you look at the other edge of it, when they have severe disease, with neighboring lung regions, as we adjust the ventilator and look, how can we make sure that what we're doing when one region is bringing benefit to other regions? Okay. In other words, how could we be at the bedside changing the ventilator, thinking that now we're having better distribution without worsening the gas trapping? And, and so that's the question of heterogeneity. How early, how severe, how would we know we're doing the right things with the ventilator and how to apply lung ultrasound in that scenario? Right. Um, the question is that the baby, that very baby, was a nightmare because it changed continuously. It wasn't just one picture that stayed stable for I can't say a week, but even days, it changed continuously. So what we had to do, it was to follow up him regularly, at least I must say once a day with echo, echocardiography and the lung ultrasound. We didn't want to perform chest x-rays so many times, but in this case, the lung ultrasound helped us to detect the atelases, so trying to recruit as much as we could with positioning. We tried to see if, tried to see if there was a trapping. Uh, with echocardiography, we had an idea of, of um, if the baby was perfusing in the right way, I mean, in a reasonable way, so this is what we did. We found very difficult to um, manage a baby so sick and we couldn't rely only on one strategy and only on one technique. We used both and we changed the ventilator accordingly. We don't know if we did the best, but this is what we did. Marilena, but adding to Dr. Afman's question uh, regarding over distension, for a lot of uh, for a lot of situations, we can uh, avoid doing repetitive X-rays. But we've found where, when we're recruiting, especially, we've we've had a couple of cases with autopsy with pulmonary interstitial emphysema. And the lung ultrasound picture was a beeline pattern. So it, it's it's kind of difficult. So uh, what would be your experience there in chronic the babies? Yeah. The same. Uh, in our experience, I know that somebody thinks differently, but in our experience, the interstitial pulmonary emphysema is not detected by lung ultrasound. You can suspect it because the interstitial emphysema would expand a lot the lungs, but you can't see it. It's not like looking at the pneumothorax. Can I ask another question? The other part of the phenotype has to do with the central airways disease, and we're seeing uh, a huge contribution of uh, tracheomalacia, tracheomalacia sometimes with bronchomalacia. And, and other evidence of bronchial hyperreactivity. So I guess, how could we incorporate our concerns about what to do, especially those who are still on a ventilator, with uh, balancing what we do to open up the central airways with sufficient pressure 
without over distending or causing even worsened regional variability? And how can we incorporate the concern of central airways getting to your phenotype issue with the parenchymal right. disease? Yeah. Right. I can tell you what we did. I'm not, I don't know if this is the right answer. Um, we had a baby with the severe, not tracheomalacia, but bronchomalacia. So what we found, it was um, talking about lung ultrasound. It was that atelectasis would change from one side to the other according to secretion. And um, so we tried to suck a lot the, the, this baby and um, according to position, and what we tried to do, but it was really, uh, really trying, it was to increase the uh, pressure in order to expand as much as we could the uh, bronchi and up to the point that the um, atelectasis were, in, were at least limited. At the end, we track the baby. This is, was the end, but um, this is what we tried, we tried to do because there isn't a clear cutoff. You know, I don't know, I put a peep on this uh, value and I know that it would expand the, um, and keep distended the bronchi. We, we tried, we, I don't know if I answer your question. And on, of course, uh, simultaneously, we did perform functional echocardiography to see if we were causing any pulmonary hypertension, signs of pulmonary hypertension. Because if you expand it too much, the uh, lungs, of course, you, made, you make your uh, pulmonary vessels to collapse, and this would be affected by the, would affect the pulmonary hypertension sign. So we try to play with these uh, two techniques. And of course, in this case, sometimes we did perform chest X-ray. Despite we do not usually, we tend not to perform chest X-rays. If um, lung ultrasound and functional echocardiography give us um, an answer, and from the clinical point of view, the baby is doing better. We wouldn't perform a chest X-ray if we don't understand, so like that baby where we suspected a pneumothorax. We did perform a chest X-ray. Marilena, I would like to uh, share with you uh, some consideration about uh, the training for uh, the um, either uh, uh, echo, uh, cardiac echo and uh, lung uh, echo, um, because uh, um, the challenge for the future is uh, uh, in, on one hand uh, about uh, um, the uh, same neonatologist, one neonatologist can perform lung echo and cardiac echo. And so I think that the training is one of the challenge for the future because in my experience, usually um, uh, people as you is very few. So uh, sometimes uh, one uh, uh, neonatology um, makes the uh, lung echo and the other one uh, the echocardiac uh, uh, um, uh, screen so uh, the this the one uh, one question is about uh, how can uh, uh, try to um, uh, train people for uh, above um, uh, tools. And uh, the other one uh, is um, about uh, your experience, uh, practical experience uh, in uh, NICU uh, about the follow-up, because uh, I think that uh, the um, uh, another challenge is uh, um, uh, 
the the um, the right time to uh, to see the baby to look at uh, uh, the echo uh, after the uh, first one week. All right. Right, about the training, but uh, Daniele can answer about this very well. Um, about the language ultrasound training is not a big issue. Learning, learning how to perform the language ultrasound is not difficult, it's easy. I mean, one day course can give you the basis to do that. Of course, after that, you need to practice it a lot, but Dealing with language ultrasound, the technique is, uh, you can apprehend the technique very easily. The step, the next step is to integrate the um, exam, the scan with the clinical picture. This step is as important as taking the scan. And integrating both, I write, uh, you know that because you are part of that, our national uh, training program for the functional echocardiography. And um, train a guy to functional echocardiography takes a lot of time. And um, it is the longer time, I believe, in the training from the technical point of view, because you need to do basically two things to perform a basic echocardiography um, safely and in a comprehensive way. I can't say you need to, to exclude um, uh, congenital heart disease, but at least you should learn how to perform a normal exam and recognize a normal heart. And after that, you can learn and think about uh, functional evaluation. This can take at least a year, at least a year of hard working. This is the truth. So, uh, and while you are learning that, you can, of course, combine a day of language ultrasound training. That's, that won't be an, a problem. So I believe that in a unit, as usual, you need to work as a team. Probably everybody should learn how to perform a language ultrasound. This is easy. It can be done. All everybody in the same manner, in the standard way. You should um, measure the score in the same way. Um, and in a team, there should be a few people that are able to perform a comprehensive echocardiography and functional echocardiography, not only one. You can't expect that everybody learns how to perform a comprehensive echocardiography. I can't believe that. But what I believe, and I know that Patrick uh, doesn't agree with that, um, I believe that everybody in the unit can learn to assess at least a few aspects of the um, echocardiography. Everybody can assess the uh, tamponade, I mean, um, pericardial effusion, it's easy to do. Everybody can assess um, a cardiac function to see just if the ventricle is moving. It's an um, eye assessment, it's not precise, but the eye can measure uh, in a precise way, but can, can see. And perhaps a uh, velocity in the um, pulmonary artery. There are nice data from Nick Evans that show that a velocity more than not 0.5 meters per second are consistent with a normal perfusion. And uh, about the follow-up, um, I've been helped in the follow-up in my unit because in Udine, there is a strong follow-up for babies. 
which lasts many years. It's, uh, it goes back in time. It's a tradition for us. For us. So to me, it has been uh, quite easy to introduce into the follow-up the um, lung assessment and cardiac assessment. People were happy to do so. And what it happens now is that when we, um, we usually discuss together about sick babies, what have you seen from the neurological point of view? I'm telling what I've seen from the cardiac point of view. I'm telling what I've seen from the lung point of view. And it's very useful. And what I found, the families feel, um, how can I say, contained. I, I don't know how to explain. Um, they, they feel that they are follow up in all those aspects. And of course, we talked with the physiotherapist. Um, um, Professor Abman published a few days ago um, a very nice paper about the follow up and how important is it is that many professionals from different point of view work together on the same baby. And they prove they isn't it right? I'm not saying right. Still, they prove they had a better outcomes. I believe this is what we should do. Try at least, yeah. At least for the sicker babies. Thank you. One one question regarding they are asking a lot of obviously when we deal with echocardiography we need to have pediatric cardiology involved but recently they published uh, in Frontiers a paper in terms of terminology that lung ultrasound should be also named like neonatologists perform lung ultrasound but I think the professional model should be universal right I don't I I want to know what's what what would be or, or in in your experience can you defined, uh, how, how do you do in terms of credentialization or in terms of accreditation? Is there a professional long ultrasound? And, a, and I, I don't know, I don't think it's necessary to do the distinction. It's just, in my opinion, but I would like to know Daniela's opinion as yeah. well. And in my opinion, it's not a professional long ultrasound. It's like the functional echocardiography. It is the neonatologist that knows the patient. This is precise medicine, as Steve has already said today. The neonatologist that knows the patient, that knows his history, perform the uh, lung ultrasound. It's not, you can't separate the lung ultrasound from the patient. It's not like a, T, a CT. You cannot do that. You have to interpret those data. You need the clinical data that you know. You need to know the patient. You see, I, I'm telling you, why did we start the protocol since birth? Why do we insist that a baby has to have both lung ultrasound and echocardiography at birth? Of course, the healthier babies, let's say more than 28 weeks, I don't care if they get an echo at 48 hours, but it's 23, 24 um, sick babies, they should have an echo within 24 hours between 12 and 24, because you do need to know what you are dealing with. That baby has a history before, in the, um, a fetal history, and you perform your echo there, your um, lung ultrasound and echocardiography, and you know where you are. At least you know where you start with. So I don't believe that you need a professional exam. I don't know, Daniele, what do you think about it? Well, uh, I could speak about that for hours and I will not do that because I love much more to talk about, you know, <laughs> science and uh, phenotypes for uh, 
uh, which I have some ideas um, uh, following the uh, Stephen uh, comment. But I just want to say, because I've wrote it in the, uh, uh, in the chat, that unfortunately I see here how neonatology is affecting by sort of a poor cultural situation. Let me say so as neonatologists, because mainly I'm a neonatologist. Then I became also a peak unique guy, but whatever. So the adult critical care physicians, they are doing their point of care ultrasound since quite a long time ago. Do you think that they are calling at three o'clock in the morning, the cardiologist to review that? I'm, I'm telling you, not a word. Same applies for lung ultrasound. So we are in this situation because unfortunately we are culturally poor. And from quite a long time, we didn't look at what was happening in the adult critical care world, thinking that there was something unrelated to us because we have different patients, which different whatever. For sure, there are peculiarities. An adult cannot have a PDA, by the way, but physiology is the same and a neonate is not an animal or a mineral. So what Marilena said is totally true. And that's exactly what I wrote in the chat. POCUS is not a tool for cardiologists, radiologists, whatever. CT scan is a tool for them. A targeted ultrasound to make a refined diagnosis is a tool for a radiologist. An echocardiography to see if there is a TGA or any other cardiac malformation, that's for pediatric cardiologists. But what we're talking about right here is something in the head of a critical care physician. So if we think about a neonatologist like a critical care physician, he has the right and the absolute need to do that to understand what is the patient physiology, right? Exactly the same way he can use a stethoscope. Otherwise, we renounce to understand well the patient physiology and we do something that is kind of middle-aged in my, in, my, in, in, my, in my mind, let's say so. Having said that, then obviously there are practicalities because regulations can be different in different states and in different countries. But I can hardly believe that there is a country where it's forbidden to do ultrasound for somebody who is anyway a medical doctor, right? So now there are evidence-based guidelines out there, it's the ethnic and other one. There are many, that's not a problem. It's a matter of how you can integrate the uh, learning process. As Mariana said, it's relatively easy. By the way, we're studying here that in Stanford right now. Uh, but anyway, it's relatively easy for lung ultrasound more complex for point of care echocardiography, but still doable. And uh, you have in your unit to make very clear that you are not doing that for refined diagnosis. We do in Paris ultrasound every day. We don't do chest film. I can tell you, we're calling the pediatric cardiologist for the congenital heart diseases. That's not our job. Conversely, we are never calling them for evaluating PPHN, PDA, edema, these type of things. Yeah, can I comment on this also? I think both Danny and Marilena have raised such important points and I agree with them completely. I think uh, one of the examples I think of in uh, the pediatric uh, pulmonology field was introducing bronchoscopy for children and newborns. And back then there were some union related issues almost, right? This <laughs> siloization. Um, the otolaryngologists were so upset with us, ENT doctors, right? Pediatric surgeons were upset with us. We had no business looking. We didn't know what we were going to see or say. And lo and behold, when they realize it's not an either or setting, that there's a richness that we can apply these methodologies. Good. And it's been tremendously successful. And it's routinely taught now to all pediatric pulmonary fellows without issue, it's sort of expected as part of their certification, they have these skills. And I think the, the same way of, of echo and, and lung ultrasound and things like that, you as the neonatologist of the bedside know the context, you know the physiology, you know the questions there. Okay. And so there's some richness to the finding that you could then apply that's so invaluable. At the same time, what I always believe in is opening the doors, Inviting your radiologist, your cardiologist to participate along with you, of course. And that's where you could really sharpen the questions, fine tune things, uh, and provide even advice on how they could sharpen their own approaches to disease. And to me, the richness is the interdisciplinary care 
but also interdisciplinary training in terms of how to think about the physiology of disease. And then finally, when it comes to linking it with long-term outcomes, especially important that the folks who are gonna be following these babies also have a sense of what happened in the nursery, what was going on then and there, and it shouldn't be sort of you're either inpatient or you're not uh, in that way. So, so I think you're opening the doors of what you're doing in such wonderful ways. And I think having engaged conversations and about pursuing how vital this is for neonatology to do better and better with the outcomes of our kids. And so I really agree with these comments and stuff. Yeah, thanks. Thank you. Just want to add, I think that, um, Marilena, that was such a wonderful presentation and this discussion has been really robust and, and really helpful. And I want to, you know, thank all of you for, um, you know, for um, spending the time and really, you know, putting a lot of thought into these discussions. Um, one final question, if I may, is, um, when I think about the time frame of seven days being able to predict BPD and pulmonary hypertension at that point, you know, the 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 dream would be that we could then stop it. Um, yeah. And so how, you know, where are we in that process? Because, um, you know, I feel like if we can't make any movement in that in that realm, then, um, you know, we still have so much more work to do. So, you know, for any of you, where do you think we are in that process? Yeah, if I could comment, yeah, I, this is such an important question. First of all, the possibility that we should be doing different things for different babies, precisely based on what you've seen by echo, lung ultrasound, and other things. And I would add antenatal factors is already setting the stage. I mean, what we've learned about uh, IUGR as impacting even the first day of life, oligohydramnios for a given level of prematurity, preeclampsia and choreo, of course, and how can we better phenotype and characterize right out of the shoots, right after birth, on top of what happens as early as possible with the physiologic needs, what our treatments are as early in the course as possible. And the example I'd like to raise about the pulmonary vascular disease story, recently I think some wonderful work came out of the Netherlands from Sané Ahrens and uh, Rolf Berger, for example, where we could say that, gosh, the first days of life, we could see these changes by echo. And indeed what they showed, like, like others have shown, that it does associate with poor outcomes later, as, as Marlena mentioned in her talk. But what they did was enrich this by further subtyping these babies into, they had PH, yes, but some had PPHN, meaning they had extra pulmonary right to left shunt causing hypoxia. Some had sort of delayed transition or a little bit of a roller coaster. Pressures are a little high and yet they're not as profoundly ill. And then others where it's just there, but the baby doesn't look so bad. And so, and what they said is, gosh, is it mostly left to right shunt with the ductus? Is it mostly right to left with extra pulmonary shunting or really neither of those three different categories? And they characterized those babies, tracked them and saw the PPHN babies, the one had the worst survival. But the interesting thing is if you're designing a clinical trial now, to Tina, your question about what do we do next? Well, I don't think if you had a predominant left to right shunt, you wanna give a pulmonary vasodilator. So if you could subcategorize that group who are right to left, for example, then you could start doing trials and interventions in them that would be different from those who were left to right or had no shunt. And those are ways of being more precise with the clinical trials and, and having impact and outcomes. And, and the danger is if we just continue to lump together, even with such thing as pulmonary vascular disease at day seven and being on a ventilator at day seven, those are helpful tools. But as sharp as we can be early on to then with that phenotyping, randomized to trials, do interventions, then I think we'll be well on our way. Because BPD, after all, at the end of the day, it's not a binary diagnosis. It's there, there's just a continuum from having none in our classic sense to severe, everything in between. And so I think this is a way of being sharper and better for improving outcomes. Yeah, can, can I add something on that? I, I can only 
I cannot agree more with, with Stephen. Uh, Marilena started to talk with a beautiful um, slide from the uh, International Unita Consortium, the, uh, the Robin slide from the paper back in 2017. That's really, really nice. Back then, we were complaining that we don't have any tool to characterize the different phenotypes. We don't have any imaging tools. And uh, we have been lacking that for quite, I would say, a long time. Now we have it. So now we, we have the possibility to anyway phenotype better BPD, which unfortunately I would say that everyone agrees is not just one disease. Fabulous. Thank you guys so much for all of this. I think we're a bit over time. Um, and, uh, and, you know, we probably need to say goodbye, but um, really appreciate everybody's input and um, enthusiasm. Thank you. Well, well thanks you. to everybody. Marlena, beautiful Funny. job again. Thank Wonderful you. presentation. It was amazing. Thank you, Marilena. Very Thank nice. You. Very nice. <laughs>